Major funding for these programs is made possible by grants from Chase Commercial Term Lending and Capital One Bank, New York Community Bank, the Wickoff Group, MNT Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Genova Burns, Jean Tomasi and Webster, Greenberg Traurig, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company. Additional funding is provided by grants from AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Layumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Colliers International NYC, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, First Nationwide Title Agency, Flushing Bank, Friedman, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, Hap Investment Developers, Herrick Feinstein, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Chairman USRealty.com, John Katsimides, Red Apple Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Matone Group, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, New Banks, People's United Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the CUNY TV Foundation, the Continuum Company, Urban American, and these friends. What's happening in the food business today? How hard is it to go open up a restaurant? You know, you think it's an easy task? I don't know. But with the assistance of my executive producer, the man who always brings the talent over here, Drew, we have assembled a group of guys to talk about how hard it is to open up a restaurant. What's happening today? My guest today, uh, we have the combination. We have Frankie Castronova. We have uh, Harold Dieterle, Morris Glocker, Frankie's partner, Frankie Fascinelli, and, of course, the inimitable Drew Naporin. So, you know, you're like the dean of restaurateurs. You've been around longer. You know, he's your partner over there in Batard, right. fantastic restaurant that recently opened up. Right. Okay, you know everybody over there. You know, if you were their age, okay, you know, how hard would it be for you to open up a restaurant? I mean, you can't be running the, you know, the marathon one day and finding a location to open up a restaurant and you find an ad in the New York Times for $1,000 a month. Yeah, life has changed. One of the reasons that uh, Marcus and I are partners is because he's of the moment right now. First of all, he's talented and he's got youth on his side. But I would say the difficulty and the reason I think uh, I'm still involved is because the, the economics of the restaurant business have changed dramatically. Uh, from when... Yeah, but look at these two guys. I mean, they, they were even, you know, trained chefs, okay? And then this year, September, they're going to be celebrating the 10th anniversary, you know, of Frankie's... But, but you see, they're a throwback in a way because they have discipline. We, work, we know each other for many years, and we work together, but uh, ask them. Um, when oh, am I, when am I, I opened, allowed to ask a question? Well, when I opened uh, my first <laughs> restaurant, when I opened my first restaurant, <clears throat> my rent was $100 a day, Today, most of us are paying close to $1,000 a day. Right. So they have a discipline. They, they decided that their food was so good you that see, people would find them in Brooklyn. Is, here's what happens. Correct. You have to remember, a Brooklyn boy remembers Carroll Gardens. Carroll Gardens wasn't once a neighborhood. Today, it's very <clears> chic. You know, I remember when they opened up the first hotel in Carroll Gardens, I said to the guy, who's going to go over there? Who's going to downtown Brooklyn? Ten years ago, Brooklyn was not the same Brooklyn of today been changing every day every day so today let's let's talk about you you know you started over there with one restaurant in Brooklyn then you opened up a second restaurant in Brooklyn oh, then you went to meat so you left Italian food you went to meat then you open up a cafe then you then you go into Manhattan the high rent district Hudson Street so how is it today to open up a restaurant 
And, and then you have this thing called res, you know, where these chefs come around. Well, what, what we did was when we had enough money, we bought a building because part of the problem is paying rent to a landlord. So if you can save enough money or get money from a bank, you could actually open, buy your own building. Then you can put whatever you want in there. And that's basically what Frank and I are doing. Over so at which building do you own? Uh, we own the building in Red Hook, which is on Columbia Street. Uh, we don't have a restaurant in there right now. That's, that's, that, the, that's, that's, where, you the have, that's the where you have the oil pit, you know? Yeah, that's the res concept. Yeah, we own one of the buildings that, uh, where Prime Eats is. But, you know, the task of opening a restaurant now, you know, like if, if Drew was to come into the restaurant business square one now, it would be a completely different business. You know, he's, he's learned along the way, you know, all the new tricks because it's not only dealing with the landlords and the rent, it's dealing with the building department, it's dealing with the fire department, it's dealing with the health department. The DEP is now in your pocket, you know, the tax man's in your pocket, the, the credit card companies are in your pocket. So opening a restaurant is a really complex equation in 2014, you're gonna especially. going to go back to Austria. Yeah. Okay, he's going to say forget it. Okay. Austria is probably, you, you know, <laughs> close, it was a good close, close to that. Saying. It's close to that. Yeah. Pretty much the same. Uh, okay. Well, it's the same. I mean, there's just all these different agencies and, and stuff there. They're all, you know, they're all basically trying is to. Is he a martyr? I mean, I realize he grew up in Long Island. Okay. <laughs> you know, he has a combination Italian and German over there. But you opened up three restaurants over the last couple of years. Yep. You, as we would say, proverbially, are you Meshiga? No, 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 no. I just, <laughs> you know, I, I found, you know, we're all in Greenwich Village and the, and the West Village, and I just, I love the neighborhood over there, and so I try and, I figured, I think, figured my time would be spent you, wisely if I just kind of bounce around you, and I you spend. You know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. At one time, nobody, West Village, the meatpacking district, I remember when I did a show when uh, the guys who originally bought uh, 111 8th Avenue and they had to find investors, okay, so you had all, okay, it was nothing over there. <laughs> The West Village today is one of the highest areas. Yep. The rent, I mean, the meatpacking district, if somebody wanted to open up a restaurant in the meatpacking district, what would the rent be? Uh, astronomical. But, but ask the question, why did it go from uh, an un uninhabited neighborhood like uh, even the Lower East Side to vibrant today? It's because the restaurants go in there and they create the whole... The, uh, the, good, the goods and services. We, even in Brooklyn, you know, these yeah. guys are pioneers, but... Uh, we. It, we I, I, I did the same thing 30 years ago in Tribeca. Tribeca, exactly. I mean, so, but basically, we go where we can afford the rent, and then the customer, if they're savvy enough, sees the difference, and they'll travel. They'll go out of, the, out of their way to find a more superior product where the bar is raised. So here's the question. I, I, you know, I have to feel bad. It's like a martyr. How could you be his partner? I mean, at least he's smart enough to realize talent. Well, you know, okay. Yeah. How do you, how do you <laughs> like working with the dean of food? Okay. It's great. It's great. I mean, uh, cooking alone is. I think it's not enough anymore these days. You have to really know about all the aspects of uh, running a restaurant and opening up a restaurant. And I thought the risk is definitely not that high if we're gonna partner up with someone like Drew Nierpoint, who runs the business for so long and knows how to open restaurants and. Um, you know, learning, learning step by step and not being too arrogant to Speaking go too fast. Speaking of that, didn't one of you open up a restaurant originally in like 2002, 2003 with some other partner before <coughs> or read something? Uh, yeah, I did something in, uh, in Chelsea uh, on, on 20, 22nd Street and how the and 9th Avenue. It did, well for, it did well for a few years. You know, it's, it stayed open for a few years, but you know, it was a similar situation. You know, you had you had so many different uh, variables, you know, to try and stay in business. And when you have a very high rent, you know, that's like having another partner. <laughs> so, so here, here's a question, and I remember I think uh, Drew was, of course, Drew was on the show because I can't do food without Drew. And uh, I, I had the guys from the meatball shop, and I said, "How do you open up your store?" He said, "You know." These were all these guys who came there, you know, my partner is a good-looking guy, and they all remembered, you know, the, all, the, all of his buddies would take, you know, they said, if you're going to open up a restaurant, I'm going to give you money, okay? And that general comment normally doesn't happen, but he said that's how he raised his money, you know. People would come in, and, you know, these guys who had hedge funds, I want to own a piece of a restaurant, yeah. I want this and that. Is that still happening today? Do you know, do you know how I raised money? No? No. No. We did a dinner at the Tribeca Grill. Oh, no kidding. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. We did, uh, me and another fellow who were on, uh, on the show Top Chef 
right after the show, we had done a I dinner that. At, at, at Tribeca Grill, and everybody bought tickets, and I was just handing out, I was trying to raise money for, for Perilla at that time. So a top chef, yep. the original top chef over here, how do you decide to open up a restaurant? These guys we knew, you know, they, they, they were Queens guys. They didn't really, you know, they, they had to find something. You know, they hadn't seen each other in about 18 years or something like <clears throat> yeah. that. Almost and then they 20. finally got uh, brought together in 2003 and opened this up. I mean, I just kind of figured it was time to do something on my own. You know, I had, I had a good amount of publicity behind me. I was working at the Harrison for a while and, um, you know, they weren't really doing anything new. And I was ready, you know, I was, I was the chef there. So I was, I was... I just felt like I was ready. I wasn't ready. You're never ready. But, so uh, how hard was you know, it for you to get the friends and family, let's say, to open up that restaurant? It took it took a year just to raise. It took a year just to raise the money, and it probably took another six months to fund the space because it's really it's super challenging as a first time operator getting a landlord to like you know to say okay it's yours when you have you know people that have multiple restaurants that are all fighting over the same space, especially back in like 2006 when the economy was 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 really really strong mm. and people were just. See, what's interesting about Harold's story is you would think it would be the prototypical story. He's on TV. He actually wins the first season. So everyone's waiting for the restaurant to open. But the reality is he's done it, and it's been successful, not because of all the hype and fanfare, but because the bottom line is you know how to cook. The restaurant exists on its own. Uh, your restaurants exist because people like the food. They're not going and going for the celebrity it, it, chef it, it, angle of it all. It's very interesting. I, I do remember you once brought a, uh, uh, a female chef on the show who has more, she has more TV time than she has restaurant time. And, you know, sometimes, you know, you, ha you could be a good TV celebrity There's and you could do well, but you really don't know how to run a restaurant and you may not be a great operator, okay? I mean, you worked... I mean, if you want to talk about TV chefs, you know, Gordon Ramsay, okay, you know, there's always right. this, you know, how well, how did the Gordon Ramsay have an effect when you were at the London? I mean, that was a whole different uh, story. I mean, I, I worked for Gordon Ramsay when I was back in uh, London, when I opened his second for first restaurant, which was uh, back in the time, Claridge's Hotel, we moved in there. I mean, I saw things, how, how fast you can grow and how really business is growing when you do something really great. but. The one good part of all that was the food was always good. The food was always uh, cooked right. Uh, and the concept was always right too, to a certain point, of course, when it get too big. Uh, at the London, flat out, I would say, um, the research of the market to come to New York was not done the right way. And that's what comes back to you. It's also a location. Yeah, you know, London, it's, it's, on the, it's on the tip. Of Times Square, you know, it's not in exactly. the as we would say in, in the bow tie of Times Square. The bow tie of Times Square has a certain market. Like we were talking about Brooklyn before, you know, where you are, Carroll Gardens is is a neighborhood, and you know, there's there's the question today of the Barclays Center. You know, where where is the right location? Williamsburg has become hip, and the London was not strategically located. And then you had another problem that you know the high cost of the labor at the of London course. over here. Here's a question. Besides, okay, you have a cookbook right now? Yeah, it's coming out in October. Okay. Uh, you have a cookbook, I know, that recently came out. 2010. And you also, 2010. Um, and then you also have the food processing, okay? You're in. We the, have our food products. Uh, food products. Olive oil. How important today are all those other side venues helping you with the restaurant business? They're, they're amazing. I mean, it gets your brand out there, get your name out there. People are thinking about you all the time, especially if you have good products, which we, you know, we put, you know, that with integrity, stuff that we use in our restaurants every day and stuff that we, that we believe in. Are you selling the, uh, the, these items in the restaurant also? Yeah, we sell them in the restaurant. We sell them on our website. We sell them at Whole Foods in the New York area and there in this region. And it's, uh, you know, the, the goal is, you know, generally is to get, if you have 250 people or 300 people, whatever size your restaurant is, to think about you, get in a car, get in a train, get on a bike, and come to your restaurant every day. So that's you know the the branding and the marketing. That's the that's really so, the, so the idea. Regarding that. branding and marketing, you know, and how difficult it's opening a restaurant today. You know, when you opened up in 2004, uh, okay, when he opened up, you know, that was the Stone Age. Uh, social media wasn't that important. Right. Today, how important is social media uh, on, on all aspects of your business? It's critical. Crazy. Crazy how that whole 
that whole engine just is very much you know taken over yeah just take instagram uh, which i'm getting used to but i have seven thousand pictures in my phone yet i'm not on instagram but i've watched instagram and specifically the food uh, interest the pho- photographs of the food <clears throat> and there's a whole community of people that are communicating literally almost every minute food is the most liked instagram photo anything food wise i mean especially when you open the restaurant i think people know before you open already they know already everything about the restaurant so it's very uh, so difficult that, to to meet the standards by the time you open the door what about facebook twitter it's the same category all together they're all critical it's all yeah. communication yeah. So. Yeah. what about yelp on the other side of the other coin <laughs> because yelp i i know that it's had an effect on um, when i do shows on the hospitality industry the hotel industry in general Yelp can or make or break somebody because they read too many reviews over there. It's not uh, done in, in a similar manner. Well, I mean, for, as far as the review sites go, it's definitely it's definitely the most followed for sure. Just from talking to like social social media specialists, um, you know, there's a couple things that I, that I have issues with. It first first being is that you know the there's obviously no 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 fact checking whatsoever. And the guest that writes a review doesn't actually. There's no. No, it's amateur reviews. It's totally amateur reviews. Yeah, yeah that's the problem. No, the, you could get you could get one out of ten that somebody who actually knows what they're talking about you respect and they'll have something good to say. Well, the other and thing, the other ones are just like the other thing random compared stuff. To that, like open tables at open table, you actually have had to have dined at the restaurant. Correct. Yelp, you can just write whatever you yeah. want. Yeah. That you know you bring up an interesting thing. How important is open table for each one of you? I don't, I don't think open table is that. We have a similar to open table. It's called Resbook. So it's, you go online and you can make a reservation. But it's, is that yours or is that a similar? No, it's 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 a it's a, it's service. a service it's a similar. Service and, like then, open table. and then you have you know guys like Ben Leventhal with you know started Eater, coming up with Resi where it's you know they're they're competing for or they're you know yeah, it's they're buying. Even, it's even more good, dynamic. For, for, it's going to yeah. be even a more dynamic. Yeah, but program. another interesting thing you know on opening up a restaurant, Top Chef for you working with a number of places in your, your background, is this situ- this TV program the two of you have now on the internet? On Vice, yeah. The being, being Frank. Being Frank on Vice, Munchies. It's hilarious. Munchies TV. I, this I, show is fantastic. I, I've, I, I, I know. I, 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 you know, I like right. the hot peppers, too. So, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I like those long, extra long hot peppers. you got to come out to the restaurant I, I'm first. I'm coming. So this has been helping out? <laughs> Yes, the show's great. I mean, it goes along with everything else, the social media, the products, the book, all that stuff. You know, it's important for people to, to see what you're doing, and, you know, and if they like it, then they come to the restaurant and try now, it out. What, what's very interesting, normally he brings people who come here with their publicist and all the rest. All of you really don't have a publicist. I mean, Drew is his own publicist. Well, we learned from Drew. No, and like I said, we, Drew's, we a men- Drew's, a, man, Drew's, a, Drew's, a, Drew's a mentor, you know? Just started the fist pump in the yeah, 80s. That's it. Just for the record, he's the dean of hospitality. That's not it. The dean of food. Food is or, in or, or, all, It's all in company. Or Jonathan Drew's Waxman said in Aspen, the last of the great maitre d's. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Walter's, Walter's out there. You know what? Yeah, Caesar right. Ritz. Okay. Drew Niebrand. But here is the question, <laughs> you know, which you bring up Jonathan Waxman, which was the question that I had a couple years ago when Drew was on the show. Uh, before, how important is it for you to touch the table, to be out there and to meet with the customers and socialize? Very okay. important, paramount. You gotta do Absolutely. it. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. and the and the employees, you know, and it's and it's it's equally as important. You know, like uh, before, you know, you were always focus on, on 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 customer satisfaction. You know, it was like 60, 70 percent of the customer satisfaction, thirty percent of the employees. You know, now you focus on the employees because yeah. you want your employees to be happy, you want your staff to be happy because that's going to just spread out. To, they're selling, to they're the selling your dream for you. I'm not a I'm not it's, a dining I'm not a dining room chef. I don't I don't, you know, if I see guests out on the street or whatever, I'm happy to talk to them. But I don't really work the dining room. I kind of. Yeah. I kind of stay in the kitchen. But, you have a, you, but now you have a partner. Yeah. Now, does she uh, work the dining room? Yeah. 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 Alicia, Alicia's the, the, the front of the house. Yeah. And if you have multiple restaurant. restaurants, you can't, you can't be at every restaurant all the time. Yeah. So if you're, at least your people are all out there doing the same thing for you. Got to sell, sell the staff the dream for sure. So, Dean, how today, we're in 2014, we get all this press that poor Danny Meyer is closing his restaurant because the mean, bad landlords I are killing him. Poor and Danny Meyer go together. 
<laughs> they don't go. <laughs> it's an oxymoron. I agree. It is, you know, you know. Okay, you know, Danny, who who can't make a couple of dollars in the okay, shake okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in on this one. He what? was there for 30 years. Forget about anything except the following. He paid a minimum of 60 million dollars to his employees. 30 times 2 million a year minimal. 60 million to his employees. He paid a minimum of $60 million to farmers, purveyors, wine people, $60 million. He created a community. So it, it, that means that because he's not willing to pay this extortive uh, market rent now in that neighborhood, that we, we have to denigrate his 30 years. The 30 years created a community, Michael. We got to look at what he does. He, out of every dollar that all of us take in in the restaurant business, we give back 90 cents. Correct. So are we entitled to a dime? And by the way, a lot of us don't make the dime. Maybe we just break even, but we pay our staff and our salaries. And by the way, we're doing a charity every single week of the year. So yes, in Union Square, you need Danny Meyer 30 years later for sure. And should he get a break? Absolutely. I'm not questioning giving him a break. My question is, take that into consideration because that's the big, that's the big item about restaurants and landlords okay they're making that as a generic situation but as you said you have certain landlords who want to do business with you because they they want to be there few they and want, far between though right yeah they few, few, far few and so far how between. hard you have three restaurants they you have a combination of if you include res five <clears> restaurants. <throat> how hard is it for you and you okay to open up a new restaurant very difficult i mean i i, I reopened a restaurant that I've paid rent there for 29 years. Uh, I've paid over $3 million in rent, which is nothing comparatively over 29 years because I have a landlord that appreciates a tenant who brings some value not only to his property but to the neighborhood. And so I can continue that relationship. At the end of the day, and this is probably the case with all of us, I want the landlord to look at me and want me to be his tenant. Exactly. Not be competitive with me, not be angry with but, me. But you know, put the garbage out you, right. You know, let's let's be realistic. Stuff. Richard Lefrak wanted you tremendous. to be there on 57th Street. And he Nobu. makes he makes tremendous money, almost as. But here's here's my here's a Druism. If the landlord makes more money than we can make in the premise, then let him put that's, his own business. That's a bad formula. It doesn't doesn't work for you. It, yeah. it, we can't make less than the landlord. If we could guarantee ourselves a half a million dollars a year in net. Yeah, that the landlord's trying to get from us in rent. rent so Richard left five, Rent should be five percent. <coughs> that's a healthy. That's a healthy rent. So here, here's the question. I agree with that. As we've always totally. said, you know, and we've had you with Shelly a number of times. You introduced me to Shelly. Shelly is a is a restaurateur who who believes he he says I'd rather pay percentage rents. I want these very long term leases. I want forty years. You know, you know. Well, that's God, God bless Shelly. Yeah, right. But that's the reason we're all screwed. Because of this situation, why should, I'll give you I'll give you my example of percentage rent. I was going to do a restaurant in 1997 in Harlem, and they wanted to charge me a percentage rent. Okay, so is five percent in Harlem any different than five percent on Times Square? It's the same five percent, right? Yeah. Yes. So why, what? Why would I pay a percentage? Let's just say I bring a ten million dollar enterprise to Harlem. Am, am I getting? Am I grossing that number because I'm in Harlem? No, because I'm. You're grossing. You're grossing. You know, they're point. benefiting off of your talents and your skills. Percentage rent, you know, there was a moment in Nobu when we first opened where, you know what our percentage was? 0.85%. Nice. We were paying a fair rent at Nobu, but we were doing your literally 10 so times right. what somebody else would right. do in that space. Why should from, I be, from, why should I be your, penalized by that? your skills and talents and hard work and experience. Right. You benefit. Now, why should the landlord benefit from that? Exactly. Bringing up the point, Harlem. Okay, you have the, the Red Rooster, you have a number of other restaurants over there. Is, do you see the opportunities in certain neighborhoods like Harlem, in other sections of Brooklyn, because Brooklyn is really hopping? Queens, where, where is the next opportunity to open up a restaurant if you can find a landlord who's going to be willing to work with you? There's, there's plenty of, could, yeah, there's plenty anywhere. of opportunities. You know, we, you know, for example, the, the population on, on Manhattan is only about a million people. And, but the population over where we are, is, it's, the density is 2 million people between Park Slope, Carroll Gardens, Brooklyn Heights, and that little block there. 
So there's densities of population that are underserved. It just has to, you have to break that threshold of wanting to go there. And then like we, when we stuck it out our first night, we did 60 bucks, you know, second night we did a hundred bucks, you know, and, and slowly, it slowly caught on. You know, 54 and a half million visitors to New York City last year helps. You have more of a transient tourist type of clientele. Yeah, but you Brooklyn, have a, you have a neighborhood. You, you have, have a, a dilution. So you have the support of the power of Brooklyn we, behind you. But now it. we have 22 hotels in Brooklyn. Uh, when you opened up in 2004, the only hotel was my friend uh, Josh Muss at the Brooklyn Bridge. Right. You didn't have all these Duffield Street hotels and all these <coughs> other yeah. side street yeah, hotels. Yeah, but in, in Manhattan you have the tourists, but you have a dilution of you know 8,000 restaurants or 8,000 eating establishments. So it's it's it, it the levels of playing field, but. A density of population is, you know. What about Inwood? You know, today they've been talking about there's some new restaurants opening up in the in the Inwood section of Washington Heights. I think that it doesn't uh, really matter. I mean, I think you can open anywhere. It's really about ultimately having a product that people want and love and don't have, and then people will find you. You know, people used to go to Peter Luger's in Williamsburg in the 70s and the 80s when that was like, you know, not a great place to be. But Peter Luger's, people are still going to Peter Luger's. And Peter, they're still going. Peter hey, Luger's has the building. <laughs> and, that's, and that's ultimately the point. I mean, what Frank and I try to do now is buy, buy, buy real estate and own the building. And then we don't <coughs> let, me, let me eliminate the landlord, <coughs> and it's in, in, impossible to do for us in Manhattan because it's too expensive. Which is ultimately the reason why we went out to Brooklyn, because we had an opportunity to do what we can do. What, what's critical to understand is that restaurants bring a culture, um, as important a culture as the theater is, uh, sports in New York, the food in New York is a huge uh, aspect of tourism, and uh, we create the interest. We go into neighborhoods that maybe are not. Uh, highly gentrified, and uh, if you talk about the meat district, Pastis, arguably, now they've been moved aside. Right. Union Square is going to be moved aside. I'm I'm next. I, I'll, uh, my lease is up in one very prominent space that I've had for 20 years. Next year I'm going to go through the same thing. We've offered a half a million dollars in rent. That's not good enough. And but when they come back to us saying it's not good enough, they're they're insulting us. And again, it comes down to this: we're a vibrant part of New York City. We should be valued. We should be respected. By you everybody. know, yeah. I'm, I'm doing a course at NYU, and I did invite you to be on it, but I'm going to invite one of the Frankies maybe to be on. It's called the hospitality industry. The hospitality industry, it's not hotels. You do hospitality. It's ho hotels. It's restaurants. It's theater. It's the arts. That's what the hospitality. That's why people want to be in New York City. The, the people come here because they want to have the opportunity to have all this. Speaking about that, how about Times Square? I mean, we're talking about high-grossing places, you know. You know, the triangle of Times Square could be further. What's your thoughts about that? Do you I don't think know. I, I think, like, you know, Not speaking for, for myself and speaking for these guys, because I think we're all neighborhood right. restaurant guys. Um, I certainly consider myself a, a neighborhood guy and welcome tourists for sure, but I don't, I just don't like being in that neighborhood for me. Like, I have a little bit of agoraphobia. I just don't like people all over me. Um, but... You know, it's 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 a different game. Like I'd rather play with the small numbers. Companies. And if 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 things aren't going great, I can be in the kitchen every day and make sure things start being great. So I even saw a picture of him at Batard in the kitchen. You let him go into the kitchen. <laughs> he was looking over there. So all I want to say is that once again he has brought an illustrious crew to my show, and I'd like to thank Frankie, Harold, Marcus, Frankie. And of course, Drew. And I'll see you next week. Thank you. Thanks for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us. us.